Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, welcome back, or welcome to my <laughs> Twitch stream. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, something that we've threatened to talk about a few times, and I, and we've had some some vocal commenters um, ask, asking for it, and that's shuffle sharding. Um, and uh, it should be fun. And uh, it's a topic I've covered a bunch of times uh, in talks here, here at Amazon or uh, at conferences. Um, so hopefully, I'm, hopefully I can give a pretty good thorough explanation. Um, if you've got questions, put them in the chat. As we go, I'll try to answer any I see. And I, I always do a scan at the end and try to get through any questions I wasn't able to address um, there. And, and, and with that, we'll begin. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch to a document view uh, so we can see, see some diagrams and notes as we go. Um, so um, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a little digression, which is that um, the word invent or invention has always kind of rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I don't know what it is about it and and maybe it's just like the folks I've heard using that word or the folks who like claim to have invented things over the years um, uh, it, it just it always strikes me as like I don't know kind of prideful or there's ego there or certainly a lack of humility and um, I find especially in the arena of like computer science or mathematics and so on um, many people have invented uh, to have it to use air quotes um, the same things over and over again and that's definitely the case with shuffle sharding um, and it's something I actually discovered I prefer the word discovered <laughs> um, when we were building Amazon Route 53 and um, I was reading a book uh, I, uh, I was reading Don Newt's book actually he came out with um, one of his series on com combinatorials at the time, and those were kind of in my head. And then we had this problem to do with Route 53, how we would, you know, do DDoS mitigation. And I kind of thought up this scheme. And later I ended up giving it this name, Shuffle Sharding, um, because we needed to write about it in, in like blog posts and so on. And so it needed a name, and, and Shuffle Sharding seemed like a good name. But uh, I also, just to kind of like underscore the point, along the way, found out that actually this technique is quite old. And there are lots of systems that incorporate shuffle sharding. <laughs> and there's, in fact, you know, well known algorithms that actually incorporate shuffle sharding in their designs. And those algorithms, like, long predate anything I came up with. So that was a real, <laughs> like, a real good lesson to me personally, at least, in, you know, um, don't ever really think you invented anything. You probably didn't. Other people have probably seen these things before. Um, but um, but I've had a lot of fun with it, and it's been uh, a technique we've used over and over again at AWS, at least. And, um, and let's get into it, right? So um, in distributed systems, right, in online systems, like websites, web services, all sorts of things, right, it's super, super common that you've got, um, you know, you've got clients and servers, right? No one is surprised by that. <laughs> so there's a client, and they make requests, and you got a bunch of servers, right? Um, and like, if it's if it's a website or a read-only web service, you know, typically it's really easy to make it horizontally scalable, right? You can you just add more servers if you've got more load, and so on, right? And that's a, a really common um, common pattern that's out there. We, we, I'm sure, have thousands of services that look like this, right? But there's um, always a risk that, you know, you could have some client or customer or user um, do bad things to the service, right? And bad things can include attacking it, right? Trying to exploit, you know, maybe a bug or, or, or some kind of vulnerability, or they might just be doing something simple as like hitting it really hard, right? Just overloading it with lots of requests uh, or, or retries, getting into a retry storm or something like that, right? And 
Uh, and when that happens to these systems, right? Like if you just get a client or a customer over here and they're sending you way too many requests, more than you can cope with, faster than you can scale up, well, you're going to have an outage, right? Like these servers, in the worst case, you know, they're just going to become overloaded and they're not, not going to be able to serve um, your customers anymore, which sucks, right? And so one thing you can do, right? One, so um, we have this measure of, of uh, kind of system availability at AWS that we call blast radius, which just means like, well, if you have an event like this, the blast radius for, for that kind of event is complete. Like the, the entire system is down. Your blast radius is like infinite. Right? Every, everything was impacted. Now, one common way to reduce the blast radius of occurrences like this is just traditional sharding, right? So let's say you've got um, six boxes. You could reorganize, and you could say, well, we're going to have the exact same amount of hardware, the same amount of resources. We're going to have six boxes, but we're going to divide them into three shards, right? And so you might have shard A, which has two boxes, so you still got some redundancy, right? If one box fails, you don't have a single point of failure. Uh, shard B and shard C and you're going to take all your customers and you're just going to give them a, a shard like at random right you, you don't have to do it at random you could like assign them to shards like based on load balancing or capacity or placement or something like that but like at random works fine uh, so we take this customer say and okay he, she's assigned to uh, shard A right and this other customer, uh, we're gonna we're gonna assign that customer to shard B, and so on, right? And so one third of your customers say are on shard A, one third of your customers are on shard B, right? This is a very old technique. <laughs> you know, we've been sharding systems as long as we've been building systems. And now the blast radius is a as a third, right? So if if a customer over here drives too much load or triggers a bug or something like that, well, they're certainly going to impact their shard. So that goes down, as do, and like a, a third of my customers are now impacted. But, um, but now the customers on the other shards are not impacted. So the blast radius is much lower, right? This is great. If you can shard a system, always do shard a system. This is great. Um, and in fact, a, a simple kind of example of this sharding is like AWS regions, right? Like we've got like, many, many regions these days, right? And so some customers may be impacted by event in, in region A, but like our customers using all the other regions don't even notice, right, for the most part, which is great. And just a nice, simple way that like sharding and blast radius reduction help. And so shuffle sharding um, is kind of extending this technique in a combinatorial way <laughs> to get even better results, right? And so what we do in shuffle sharding is we say, OK, again, take the same amount of hardware. right? So let's say I've got six machines, like here. right? But instead of like the kind of sharding we had here, where we, give, we just have like this fixed set of two, that's shard A, this fixed set of two, that's shard B, this fixed set of two, that's shard C, we're instead going to have like virtual shards, or what we call shuffle shards where for each customer, we're going to come up with a combination of two boxes. So let's say this is customer A, and we're going to give her this box and this box, just to pick two at random. right? And uh, let's say this is another customer, customer B. We're going to give customer B this box, and let's say this box, just to pick two at random. right? And you can see how this is going. right? And, um, and let's say we've got customer C here. Um, just to have some overlap, let's say customer C gets this box. Sorry, I need to move that a bit. Um, and this box, right? Well, now let's model some some events. So let's say uh, customer A drives too much load, right? Tries to really overload the system. Well, they're going to impact this box, and they're going to impact this box because that's where they're mapped to them, right? But notice, no other customer is fully impacted. B doesn't even notice. They're not sharing any capacity with A. And C, unlike before, um, is, is, has an out. Like, yeah, one of their boxes is impacted. But as long as we've got some fault tolerance, which can, can be as simple as like retries, 
um, they can work around that and they can get service from this box over here, right? And the, the, the beauty of this arrangement is all we're doing is reassigning the same amount of hardware. So there's no additional money being spent here and we get a dramatically ba better blast radius. And the reason is because there are six shoes two combinations of two boxes here. So there are six choose two um, shuffle shards available, right? And the blast radius becomes one over six choose two. And if you've never did, so, so when I say six choose two, that's just like a mathematical notation, a way of saying, like, pick two things from um, six. And, uh, and the, the mathematical formula for that, um, you can look it up. It's on Wikipedia. It's pretty easy. Uh, but it involves factorials. And it scales with n factorial, where n is the bigger number. So like n choose m scales with like n factorial, right? And that, that, that is a number that can get really, really, really big fast. So with actually quite modest sizes of, of boxes, like pretty realistic numbers of servers, like 10, 20, 100, n here, and then n factorial gets really, right? And so the, and it conversely means that the, the blast radius gets really, really, really small, right? Uh, I actually have a blast radius calculator in a GitHub gist. Um, let me see if I can dig it out. Um, that um, the n like the numbers are just like ridiculous. Let me see. Dun. I think it's called shard calc. Yeah, there we go. All right, let me see if I can share my code screen, and I'll show you how this works. Dun. Um, we'll do some real math. All right, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to share my screen, but we'll try. Mm -hmm. Got to make sure I'm sharing the right terminal window, which is harder than it looks in Twitch. Uh, here we go. Nope, you see nothing, right? All right, let me just go edit that. Um, dun -dun. And we need to make this easier. Um, no, that doesn't help. Oh, there we go. Found it. Um, all right, there we go. Okay. Is that big enough to read? Let me know. Um, probably not, I'm guessing, in Twitch. Let's go fix that. Did that help? Okay, there we go. <laughs> so um, this is a Python script, which is called shardcalc.py, and I will put that in the um, uh, I will put that in the um, in the comments when I get a chance. Um, and what it does, there we go, fix that, is um, basically computes like the, all the factorials, does all the math. I'm not gonna go, go through how all that math works, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, there's really verbose comments in there that kind of explain it to people. And, and then tells you um, like what the blast radius of something is, right? So if I run, like, if I run it with six and two, which was the example we used, it tells me that, um, you know, 40% of elements never overlap with one another at all. So that's like the A and B case, 
right? And then it tells me that 53% um, of my shuffle shards overlap by one element. So that just means out of all my customers, on average, 53% of them overlap by one node with like someone else's, um, with, like, with, with a particular shuffle shard. And then um, only 6.6% of customers will ever share the exact same shuffle shard, right? So we went all the way from, just by reorganizing things with this combinatorial approach, we went all the way from a blast radius of like infinite at the beginning, and then sharding got us a blast radius of one third, so 33%. With shuffle sharding, we got all the way down to 6.6%, right? So if a bad customer or a customer triggers a bad event, that's only going to impact 6.6% .6 of, of all of my customers, which is pretty amazing, right? That's a huge reduction. And, and all we're doing <laughs> is reorganizing how six servers were used. Right um, now, if you've got bigger numbers, right? Like so, and we have a system called Hyperplane, where uh, we we actually use a um, hundred nodes is the general kind of design for a Hyperplane um, system. Um, you know, we stamp out many Hyperplane systems, but we don't just let Hyperplanes get bigger. They're kind of fixed size because that makes the engineering a lot simpler uh, and makes the reliability a lot simpler. You know, you can just test it at that design scale and then don't have to worry about it you know getting bigger and smaller and so on and the kind of size for its units are about a hundred nodes or a hundred servers and we give each customer by default five right their shuffle shard is five so if we run this with those numbers right so imagine one customer like triggered a, a huge amount of traffic or something now I, I should caveat all this and say like if that happens you know hyperplane actually isolates that customer under the hood and gives them their own dedicated capacity so that the other people aren't impacted at all. But while that happens, right, there's a very brief window where, you know, there's some capacity being shared and, and all this uh, blast radius stuff matters. And um, you can see that, uh, okay, well, only all the way down here at the bottom, 0. 0.00001, right, so I think that's about literally one in a million other customers will actually have full impact like only one in a million other customers shared the same five servers as that customer right who triggered some kind of overload condition or something like that right it's amazing you know um and uh even still way less than a percent of other customers share two nodes or, sh or share four nodes sorry um and and so on and so forth all the way down and you can see that like 77% of customers don't share any nodes at all, right, with, with the customer who might be triggering uh, an issue. So these are just massive, massive reductions in impact. Uh, and all we're doing is reorganizing our resources. And um, this came up, right? So the, the first time I came up with, you know, to use this technique uh, was, as I said, in building Amazon Route 53. So before we were building Amazon Route 53, so that's a DNS service that we built for AWS, for AWS customers to use. And um, we knew that DDoS is a really hard problem in DNS. DNS services just get DDoSed. Uh, in part, that's because, um, you know, if you can take down somebody's DNS, it's going to take down their whole business. So if you're trying to extort them or something like that, it's a good target. And also in part, it's because DNS is a UDP-based service. And UDP, can, it can be... Um, you know, attackers can use botnets and, and uh, compromised hosts and networks that don't do proper filtering to generate huge amounts of UDB traffic, right? So you get this bad combination of those two, th those two things where due to the protocol, like it's, it can be open to DDoS and due to its nature, it's a very critical system, right? So it's a juicy target. And uh, we knew that, you know, our competition, other providers, the way they solved this process was with um, basically uh, expensive custom design DDoS filtering um, appliances, literally multi-million dollar appliances that you would plug into your network and would analyze DDoS traffic in real time and had techniques to stop it, right? And um, 
you know, these days we've got similar systems that we've built from scratch. We have our own proprietary anti-DDoS scrubbing infrastructure for all sorts of reasons, and not just for DNS, but for all sorts of services. And we've got the AWS Shield team who work on that full time. But when we were building at Amazon Route 53, we didn't have any of that. And we didn't want to build any of it either, <laughs> like we did at that time, because we were just starting out. And um, there would have been a huge investment. We would have had to spend millions and millions of dollars or wait a very long time to develop that stuff to use it. And that's just not the way we build you know, our services. Uh, we, 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 we want to get things done quickly. We don't want to have a huge infrastructure footprint. We want to be profitable, <laughs> you know. We don't, and we don't have to charge customers an arm and a leg uh, for the for the services. So we can, if we can avoid costs, we can, right? And and this was kind of an, a, dile a dilemma for us because we were going, okay, well, look, are we just going to have to eat this? Do we really just have to spend ten, tens of millions of dollars on these devices? Um, and if so, what's the cost of Route Fifty Three going to be then to our customers? You know, um, or can we engineer our way out of this? And, um, and shuffle sharding was what we came up with to engineer our way out of it. What we, what we ended up doing is actually building a DNS service that was based on um, Anycast and having DNS servers that are in you know, many locations all over the world. I think we launched with 16 locations for Route 53. And, um, but even within that, actually having 2,048 kind of virtual DNS servers each with their own IP address, right? And so, and then whenever we would um, assign a customer a set of DNS servers, we would give them four of those 2048. And we use shuffle sharding to allocate those four. There's some other caveats to how we also allocated them, like you couldn't have certain domains overlap because they had bits in common. Like you can't have Amazon.com and www.amazon.com on the same DNS servers. Because then if a query comes in for www.amazon.com or Amazon.com, like you don't know which, <laughs> which, you know, which, which zone it's for and so on. So there's some other little caveats about co-tenancy. But in general, shuffle sharding is the main approach, right? And if you do the numbers on that, so if I run this script with that, right, with 2,048 name servers and giving four to each um, thing. So now, right, if you imagine, OK, I've given a customer four name servers. And let's say they get targeted by DDoS, right? Someone's hammering the hell out of them, sending a lot of traffic to their four name servers, or the four that we've assigned to them. Well, 99.2% of our other customers don't share anything with that customer, not even one name server. For them, complete, total, non-event. It's not happening, right? Uh, 0.77, so less than a percent of our customers share one name server. Now let me tell you, DNS is a very resilient protocol. Not being able to reach one name server out of four, absolutely no big deal, won't even notice it. Same for two, right? And less than a percent again, right? Share two. Same for three. We did a lot of experiments. You know, as if even one of those name servers is reachable for customers in general, their DNS resolvers and so on, they're just going to work around this. And they do prefetching and so on. And so they're even not going to notice. So this is an unbelievable level of blast radius reduction, right? You can see there that number at the end, it's so small, the number of customers that f fully overlap, that even now, like 12 years into Amazon Route 53 as a service, I doubt we have even enough customers or enough hosted zones that that ever could possibly happen. It's just such a small number, right? And all we did was reorganize how existing resources we were already going to have are allocated. Like, it costs nothing in infrastructure. All we're doing is using math and an allocation strategy to get this am these amazing properties, right? Which I love. It's an incredibly frugal approach, right? And you get get these get these these cool cool benefits. Um, and that's shuffle sharding in a nutshell, right? That's shuffle sharding one hundred and one. That's the simple form. That's normally where I stop explaining shuffle sharding. Um, but today I'm going to go into a bit more detail, and we're gonna we're gonna cover some more examples of how it's used. So the first, um, I'm going to go back to a document view. Um, 
and uh, actually, let me get the uh, let me give you the URL for that uh, script before I forget. But um, oh, GitHub wants me to confirm my recovery settings. Yes, those are correct. Um, where are my gists? All right. Um, where is Shardco? Here we go. All right. Someone else can let me know if um, if this link works. Hopefully it does. Um, so that is the uh, that's the, the script we were just looking at. If you want to read it and get a feel for for what's going on. Um, and so um, so the other place I noticed or kind of relearned where shuffle sharding is used is you can apply shuffle sharding to like allocating servers as we've seen, right? Um, but you can pretty much use it anytime you're allocating like any contended resource. So like these could be servers, but they could also be queues, right? Or they could also be databases. They could also be uh, notification streams. They could be pretty much anything that's contended. Right, you can like pick M out of N and assign those to to you know a particular customer, customer by customer, right? Um, but an interesting place um, that uses shuffle sharding is um, rate limits, right? So um, you know if if you've got a if you've got a throttle or a rate limit that you need to apply. Um, it can be useful to be able to do that effectively customer by customer because you get better fairness that way, right? If you just if you just have a big old rate limit for say a network link and you just say, you know, I want the, I want to limit this network link to like 500 megs a second uh, and you just put that in place like using a token bucket or some algorithm which we can go into in detail some other day, um, you know, it'll work but everyone will just have shared fate, right? You'll just have everyone kind of contending and trying to get their little piece of the pie, right? Um, so it's quite crude. So what you can do instead is, well, you can have that as a safety measure. You can have that as a fallback. But what you can also do is set some smaller rate limits and then bucket customers into them, right? So you could have, like, um, here I've got eight, I could say, like, let's say eight 100 megabit per second limits, right? And... Um, and let's say I assign, assign each customer to like f four of them, right, at random, right? And so customer A goes here, here, say here, and say here, right? And, um, and their flows, you know, the rule is if any of their buckets, if any of these buckets have a, have a token left or have capacity in their rate limit, then let this customer's traffic through, right? So if there's no traffic at all, this customer A will get 400 megabits per second because they'll get all the tokens here, all the tokens here, all the tokens here, all the tokens here, and they'll get 400 megabits per second. But that's effectively the like max a single customer will ever get. But if when there's lots of customers floating around, um, you know there'll be other customers getting things from each bucket. But um, uh, so they'll probably get less than 400 megabits in reality. Um, but unlike the like big single global rate limit approach, you just get way better fairness with this because what happens is, well, if A does max things out and gets the, his 400, anyone else, oh, there's my pager going off. Um, there we go, it's silenced. I get paged like a fair bit every day. <laughs> and mostly it's just pro forma stuff. I'll get to that one in a few minutes. But the um, but they um, if A maxes out his um, capacity, there's still capacity left for people who are sharing with A, right? They still, you know, have other buckets available and can use those, right? And so they're they're still good. So you get that's why you get better fairness. This actual approach, what I'm actually describing, is um, uh, stochastic fair blue. If you want to look it up, SFB, right, uh, which is a rate limiting technique that's used often, most commonly with switches, and how they achieve fairness and making sure like one sender can't dominate uh, in in there, which is pretty cool. 
Um, so that's like one precedence, right? So that's one, one different, more advanced way to think about shuffle sharding is to apply it to things that aren't servers. And then the last thing I want to go into, I told you it'd be a quick one today, is you can actually do recursive shuffle sharding, right? So imagine you've got a service like we saw before. This time we're going to draw, say, eight boxes. And, <coughs> and you've, got a, you've got a caller, A, and they're limited to, like, you know, this box, this box, this box, and this box, right, for your shuffle sharding. Well, you can also go and say, well, their caller, B, who's calling A, is limited to a subset of these. It's kind of shuffle sharding inside the shuffle shard. So you limit B to here and say here. And this has a nice property where um, if service A goes out of control, right, we're still going to get all the benefits of shuffle sharding. Like these, these four boxes will be impacted, but hopefully no one else will be. Uh, and service A is fully impacted and all of their customers. But like that's OK, because service A went out of control. You can't really do much better than that. But if what happened is it's B that went out of control and drove a lot of load to A, well, there, you're going to lose capacity here. But A can still get some service. So the rest of A's customers are still OK, right? So that's, that's even more advanced shuffle sharding. Um, all right, I'm seeing some questions. How do we keep track of servers that belong to A? So yeah, the, one of the downsides of shuffle sharding is you have to allocate things, right? You have to keep a mapping somewhere of like, well, this customer's resources are these things, right? And you need to go through that mapping anytime uh, you're accessing things, right? Um, so you, so like the for things that use DNS, for us, we uh, you know typically use unique DNS names. Like every CloudFront customer gets a unique DNS name. That they use every uh, every Route fifty three um, customer gets a unique delegation set of four name servers and so on. And the systems where we use shuffle sharding internally, we have to have like some equivalent of, of a mapping system that's that's doing that. You can use consistent hashing, um, and and you can use consistent hashing as a default. Um, often you'll want to be able to able to override that. Like if you do have a customer that gets really busy. Uh, sometimes you'll want to isolate them and do better than just the consistent hashing on its own can do. But you can do a hybrid mode, right? You can use consistent hashing, and then if you have to make any exceptions, you can just have an exception path too. So like the system first checks for an exception. If there's no exception, then it falls back to hashing. And that works. Uh, if you want to see, we've got code out there. Um, the Route 53 Infima, I-N-F-I-M-A library, can do all that for you in Java at least. Uh, and that's up on GitHub. Uh, if anyone wants to see all that. Cool. Uh, let's see what other questions we have. Uh, does shuffle sharding only make sense at a certain scale? Yeah, you got to have like a certain amount of hosts, right? Like if you only got two hosts, it makes no sense. But we saw even with just six, it was useful, right? So it's pretty modest in, 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 in the scale of things. All right. I think that's all the questions. Um, I said it'd be a quick one today. Today was going to be a short one because we're pressed for time. And now i got a page to deal with, too. Um, <laughs> so um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, if you've got any other questions, send them to me on Twitter or put them on YouTube in the comments. I'll answer them there, too, uh, when, when this goes on YouTube, which should be tomorrow or so at the latest. Um, otherwise, thank you for coming. And uh, I hope, 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 hope